Uh, we're going to continue today with the uh, fine structure and hydrogen, which we started last time. To remind you very briefly, uh, we're taking the unperturbed Hamiltonian to be what you see here at the top of the board. This uh, governs the, uh, this is the electrostatic model that governs the uh, gross Coulomb effects of the atom. Uh, the perturbation H1, which we also call HFS, which stands for fine structure, consists of uh, three terms, the relativistic kinetic energy, the Darwin term, and the spin orbit term, all of which are of the same order of magnitude. These three terms, in the case of a hydrogen-like atom, are listed not explicitly here, which we talked about them last time, and I explained the physical meaning of them, so I won't go over that again. Uh, now, um, uh, at the end of the hour last time, uh, I was uh, presenting you some uh, strategies for uh, dealing with uh, time-dependent, excuse me, with uh, degenerate perturbation theory, uh, in which it's necessary to diagonalize, and diagonalize the perturbing Hamiltonian inside the degenerate eigenspace of the unperturbed system, uh, so that the matrix is diagonalized. And um, uh, for the time structure uh, problem, the matrix can get pretty big. Uh, so, um, uh, when you diagonalize a matrix, of course, uh, the amount of work depends on the basis that you choose, and some bases are easier than others. So, uh, I, uh, at the end of the hour last time, I was addressing the question of strategy for the choice of a good basis for an, an analysis of the, uh, of the uh, perturbing Hamiltonian. Uh, the basic rule is, is that, uh, is that uh, well, uh, when, when we choose, typically when we choose bases uh, for calculations like this in quantum mechanics, they are uh, simultaneous eigenbases of some set, set of, of complete set of community observables. And um, as I showed last time, if the perturbing Hamiltonian commutes with one of the members of the complete set, uh, then the matrix elements are diagonal in the corresponding quantum number. So in an extreme case, you might have a perturbing Hamiltonian which commuted with all of the members of the complete set of commuting observables, which are used to create the basis that you're using. And if that's the case, then the a matrix of the perturbing Hamiltonian will be strictly diagonal, and it, there won't be any matrix to diagonalize. The, the eigenvalues will be the diagonal elements. In effect, that reduces uh, degenerate perturbation theory to the non-degenerate case. All right, uh, so uh, in the case of the uh, fine structure uh, calculation, there are two obvious bases that we can use. Uh, well, first of all, uh, degenerate, uh, the, the, the eigenspaces of the unperturbed Hamiltonian have an energy we call the EN, they depend only on the quantum number of n, and these are two n squared fold degenerate, uh, counting the spin. So the matrix in question is going to be two n squared by two n squared. It could be quite a big matrix. Um, there are two fairly obvious choices for uh, bases in the degenerate eigenspace. One of them is what uh, we call the uncoupled basis, back when we were coupling angular momentum. The uncoupled basis consists of the uh, central force eigenfunctions for, Hamil for the hydrogen-like Hamiltonian, which I'll, I'll denote in Ket language by NL and M sub L, uh, multiplied by the uh, spin basis functions SMS, where MS is, is either up or down. Uh, that's back to spin gives you the factor of two here. And uh, for shorthand for this, let me write this in the form of NL, M sub L, and M sub S, listing out all the quantum numbers here, except for the spin itself, which I'll admit because it's a constant, which is one half, and it never changes. So the others over here are the ones that are variable. Uh, these quantum numbers that are listed out here uh, correspond to certain operators of the complete set. Uh, the n is the Hamiltonian, the l is l squared, the ml is l sub z, and the ms is s sub z. And here's the collection of four uh, commuting operators complete set that gives us uh, an eigen basis. Now in the perturbation calculation, the index n indicates the degenerate subspace of the unperturbed system that we're working in. And the remaining three indices are, are labeling the vectors that lie inside that unperturbed uh, eigenspace. Another obvious choice for a basis is what we'll call a coupled basis. This, obtains, this is obtained when we couple the uh, orbital and spin angular momentum to get the total angular momentum. And I'll denote the vectors of the coupled basis by, we make a little space here, n, l, j, and m sub j, uh, in which the quantum numbers correspond to operators h, L squared, J squared, and J sub Z. And uh, these uh, basis vectors are given by a much shortened expansion in terms of the uncoupled basis vectors. So we sum on the magnetic quantum numbers, ML and MS. Uh, there, is a, uh, there is a vector of the uncoupled basis, NL, ML, and MS. 
and then multiplied by a flex Gordon coefficient, which is Ls and L and S, scalar product of J and J. And you can kind of remember this formula because you're summing on ML and MS, and if you look at the first uh, ken and bra here, it resembles a resolution of the identity where the ML and MS are the labels of the basis vectors that you're summing over. All right. Uh, so these are the two obvious bases uh, that one might choose for this uh, perturbation problem. And now what I'd like to do is to find out which one of them is the best. And we'll do that by making a table of uh, operators that commute with the perturbing Hamiltonian H1, or more exactly, the, the three terms that are in it. So for the three terms, I'll list them out, the relativistic kinetic energy, the Darwin term, and the spin organ term, like this, to make the table. And then for operators, let's list, first of all, the orbital angular momentum, all three components L. Then next, the square. Then next, the spin angular momentum, and then the square of that. And then the total angular momentum, J, and the square of that. For a grand total of, uh, of six operators here across the, across the row. Now let's start with the relativistic kinetic energy Hamiltonian. It's over here. And you see it's a bunch of constants multiplied by the fourth power of the momentum. The fourth power of the momentum means p squared squared, and uh, p squared is the vector p dotted into p, so it's a dot product of two vectors. And as a result, uh, it's a scalar operator. Uh, it's a scalar operator under uh, purely orbital rotations uh, because the momentum p is a purely, purely orbital operator. It's a vector under, or, under orbital rotations. And as a result, it commutes with all three components of L, which are the generators of orbital rotations. Now, if you want to check the commutators directly by computing the, the commu using the, the doing a commutation the commutator calculation, you find the commutator of L with P to the fourth. You're welcome to do that. You'll find the answer is zero. But the argument I'm showing you is an illustration of how, uh, going back to the, the theory of rotations, you can see that the P dot P is invariant in rotations. It means that it means that the operator must commute with the generators of rotations, which are the L. Now, if the operator commutes with all three components of L, it commutes also with any function of those, which includes L squared. Now, next, we move on to the spin. This operator commutes with the spin because HRKE is a purely orbital operator, and it doesn't act in the same space as spin. So it commutes with any function of the spin operators, including all three components of S squared. And then finally, we come to J, the total angular momentum. J is a generator of total rotations, both orbital and spin rotations simultaneously. Well, P dot P is invariant under total rotations, just as it is under only orbital rotations. So it's a scalar under rotations generated by J just as well as those generated by L alone. And therefore, the, the operator also commutes with J squared. And we see that HRKE, in fact, commutes with all of the operators in this list. Now next, let's look at the Darwin term. A Darwin term is a bunch of constants times a delta function at the origin. It's a function only of the position vector, so this is once again a purely orbital operator. It doesn't involve the spin at all. The, uh, of course, it's a singular operator because of the delta function here. Uh, the delta function can be, at the origin, as you see here, the delta function can be uh, regarded as a rotationally invariant uh, function of position. The reason is you can think of it as being the limit of a function, uh, an ordinary function, which is zero outside a small sphere centered, centered on the origin, and then has a non-zero value inside the sphere that gets larger and larger as you let the sphere shrink. But the point is, is that it's rotationally invariant because you can concoct it to be in a, in a concentrated in the sphere. And as a result of that, the arguments that we used previously for the purely orbital operator HRKE also apply to H Darwin, and it commutes with all six of these operators running across this row. Uh, as well. All right, then now let's turn to uh, the uh, spin orbit term. It's constants times 1 over r cubed times L dot s. 1 over r cubed is a purely orbital term and is certainly a scalar. What about the L dot s? Well, first of all, let's talk about the commutation relation to orbital angular momentum L, the generator of orbital rotations. If we apply orbital rotations to H spin orbit, what it'll do is it'll rotate won't leave our, one of our cube invariant, but it will rotate the L because L is an orbital operator. It will not, however, rotate the spin because they act on different spaces. It doesn't do anything with the spin. As far as orbital rotations are concerned, the spin is a collection of three scalar operators. They don't change under orbital rotation. 
So you've got a dot product here. If you think of it as two vectors, you're rotating one of them, but not the other one. And clearly, the dot product is not invariant. And as a result, h spin orbit does not commute with the three components of L. It does, however, commute with the L squared, because L squared commutes with the three components of L and also with S. And uh, it's a standard commutation relation in angular momentum. L squared commutes uh, with uh, three components of L. So L squared actually is a, is a good, uh, is a, a diagonal quantum number. Now what about the spin S? The spin S generates spin rotations, but not orbital ones. So again, what this will do is, it's the opposite now. It rotates the spin vector, but not the uh, orbital vector. So again, this is not invariant under, under spin rotations, and the operator does not commute with the three components of spin. Um, but however, for the same reason it commutes with S squared, actually S squared in this case is a constant operator when it commutes with everything. Now we come to J, the toe rotations. Uh, J rotates both orbital and spin variables, and if it does so, then both sides of this dot product are rotated by the same rotation, and the dot product is invariant. Mm -hmm. So in fact, L dot S commutes with J, and therefore J squared. And so here's what we get. Here's our table of commutators. And um, you can see uh, that the spin orbit term is the one that uh, makes us uh, think uh, a little bit, because it doesn't commute with everything. And in particular, you can see the spin orbit term does not commute with all of the operators of the, of the, that, that, that go to make up the uh, complete set that specifies the uncoupled basis. It doesn't commute with either LZ or S and C. However, looking at the operators that constitute or that make up the coupled basis, you see it does commute with J squared and J Z, it commutes with L squared also. So in fact, the, uh, what we see is the coupled basis is really the right one to use because it makes all three of these terms diagonal. And that means that in order to compute the energy shifts, we just need to compute the diagonal elements of all three of these terms in the coupled basis and then just add them up. And that will be the fine structure energy shifts. All right. So uh, I'll outline for you the uh, common functions involved in doing that. Let's start with the uh, let's start with the relativistic kinetic energy term. We take uh, a vector of the coupled basis in L J M C J and sandwich it around the relativistic kinetic energy like this for the same value of M C J on both sides because we just decided we only need to look at the diagonal elements. Same values of, of all three quantum numbers on both sides. Now, HRKE is a purely orbital operator, but it's being sandwiched between vectors of a coupled basis. So let's use the clutch gordon expansion, which is up there, for both the bra and the cat here, to expand this back into the uncoupled basis. And if we do, we get a four-way sum on ML and MS, and ML prime and MS prime, like this. And then there's, it begins with the clutch gordon coefficient, it's JMJ. And then we get LS, ML, and MS. And then in the center, we've got the vector of the uncoupled basis, NL, ML, and MS on the left, the perturbing Hamiltonian HRKE in the middle, and then NL, ML prime, and MS prime on the right, and then the final clutch Gordon coefficient, LS, M, ML prime, MS prime, and then JMJ. The JMJ and the JMJ are the two sides of the same. That's the same as these two quantum numbers here and here. They're the same on the two sides. All right. Now, in this central matrix element, since HRK is a purely orbital operator, the spin parts of the uncoupled basis, uh, just, they just, in effect, shine right through this operator. And they combine together and give you a quantum of delta the spins. So the central matrix element is equal to a chronic or delta ms and ms prime. And then what's left over is a purely orbital optic matrix element, which is nl, ml on one side, hrke in the middle, and nl, m sub l prime on the other side, like that. Right, so now we're, what we're doing is taking this hrke and just sandwiching, sandwiching it between the, uh, the simple force uh, wave functions for the, for the hydrogen atom. Um, the HRKE is a scalar operator, so it has the form of T00 in the language of the Wigner Eckhart theorem. And what that means is if you look at the uh, uh, if you look at the selection rule in magnetic quantum numbers, it means the answer is zero unless ML is equal to ML prime. So by the Wigner Eckhart theorem, this matrix element, the final matrix element, is a chronic or delta in ML and ML prime times a reduced matrix element. But the reduced matrix element um, and I can write it in the form of a reduced matrix element. 
But uh, the reduced matrix element is independent of magnetic bond numbers. In other words, this, this, this regardless of matrix and M, M, ML and ML prime, it's not only diagonal, but the diagonal elements are actually independent of, of the magnetic bond numbers. So I could write it as a reduced matrix element, but instead what I'll do is just choose some value for the M magnetic bond numbers, and zero is a convenient value to use, because the answer doesn't depend on which value you choose. And so this gets multiplied times uh, ML0. Let's write it this way with HRKE in the middle. And then ML0 like this, setting that magnetic quantum number equal to zero. And if we do this, then the final matrix element is something that's independent of the variables, the, the indices of summation. And so this could be taken out and moved up there outside the sum. And then what's left, what remains of this big middle matrix element is just these two chronic deltas and the magnetic quantum numbers which allows us to kill off the prime sums here and replace these prime MLs by unprimed ones. And then what we've got is two adjacent clutch gordon coefficients, but we're summing on the ML and MS and ML and MS at the final sum here. That's just the resolution of the identity. And the whole thing collapses into the scalar product of J of J with itself, which is one. And so the result is, is that this whole thing turns into ML0, HRKE, ML0 like this becomes a purely orbital matrix element, what you could have expected since it's an orbital operator, uh, sandwiched between these two states. All right. Now to further evaluate this, to boil this down even more, let's look up at the upper board there where HRKE is. And if you look at that for a moment, you'll see that I can write this this way as one over it's minus sign, one over twice mc squared times the P squared over 2m quantity squared is the same expression. But of course, P squared over 2m is the, uh, is, is the non relativistic kinetic energy. So this factor here is the same thing as let's call it T squared. If we write the unperturbed Hamiltonian, which is up at the top of the board there, let's write it as, uh, as T plus V, where V is the, uh, is the, uh, uh, is the uh, hydrogen like uh, Coulomb potential. Then T squared is the same thing as H0 minus the potential V on the square. And so our matrix element up here then becomes, I'll write it over here, it becomes NL0 sandwiched around H0 squared minus H0 times the potential minus the potential times H0 plus the potential squared. Like that. But the potential, well, H0, as far as H0 is concerned, it acts either to the right or to the left of the velocity test. And when it does, it brings out the energy level E sub n of the undercurved system. So the first term is just E sub n squared. The second two terms combine together to give you a factor of twice E sub n times the expectation value of the potential. And the remaining term is the expectation value of the potential squared. Now, as far as the expectation value of potential is concerned, since the potential is minus ZE squared over R, this is the same thing as minus ZE squared times the average value 1 over R in the hydrogen atom wave functions. But as far as the square average value of the square of the potential is concerned, this is Z squared to the fourth times the average value of 1 over R squared in the hydrogen atom wave functions. Now up at the top of the board here, I've summarized the expectation values of various powers of R in the hydrogen atom. Uh, I assume this is familiar to you because you have a homework problem on it. Um, and uh, so we can take those results and plug them in here for these two things. And then there's some algebra to do. And I'll omit the algebra. But the result is, is that we get an energy shift for the relativistic kinetic energy. And I need to look at my notes because these turn into somewhat messy formulas. We get Z alpha quantity squared. And I'll write this as minus times minus E n. That's the unperturbed energy level. Times 1 over n squared times the quantity 3 quarters minus, uh, minus n divided by L plus a half. And if you do the algebra, that's what you get. All right. And by the way, the, uh, the minus E n here is equal to 1 over 2 2 n squared times uh, times uh, z squared e squared over a naught. If I want to put 
with this. And these are just the moral levels, but I'm putting the minus sign to make the quantity positive so that this is a positive quantity here. All right. Now, before going on, a few comments about this the result here. Um, the, of course, the left hand side is an energy. Uh, the minus EN is the uh, energy level of the unperturbed system, the, uh, the, Bohr, the Bohr energy levels. So all the rest of this stuff is giving us the energy shift due to the fine structure perturbation as a fraction of the, uh, of the unperturbed energy level. Now the stuff that comes after the one, the one over N squared and afterwards, it depends just on the quantum numbers, the N and the L in particular. If we think about a, 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 an atomic state for which the quantum numbers are not too large, such as the, the ground state or the first few excited states and the hydrogen atom, then this entire expression, after including the one over n squared and following, is just some number of order unity. So the actual magnitude of the perturbation is governed by this factor z alpha squared relative to the, uh, to the unperturbed energy levels. So the z alpha squared is what we really want to look at in order to understand the order of magnitude of this. Let me remind you that z alpha is the same thing as the uh, as the uh, as the velocity uh, over the speed of light, or c times z alpha is the velocity of the electron in the ground state of the hydrogen-like atom. It's alpha times the speed of light in hydrogen, but for uh, heavier nuclei, nuclei of higher charge, because it scales as the charge. So this is something which is uh, 1 over 137 in the case of hydrogen, and it turns into something like 0 0.6 in the case of uranium. This is, uh, uh, yes, so this is the fraction of the speed of light of the velocity of the electron. So we're finding the energy shifts, though, is the square of the velocity, you know, like v squared, or v, really it's v over c squared. This is just what you expect in relativity theory for, for uh, correct, energy corrections. They go like the square, the square of v over c. Uh, so in the case of hydrogen, z alpha squared is something like 10 to the minus 4. So these are, that means that these, this shift is something like 1 part in 10,000, uh, 10,000 times smaller than the average separation between energy levels. All right. Now, next let's go on to the Darwin term, uh, the next one in this list here. If you'll allow me, I'll, it's very similar to the, uh, something that's going like, something that's going like, uh, erase the oh, look, no, here it is, here it is. Um, so it's called a big eraser. Uh, so to go to the Darwin term, let me use my eraser here. We'll just put the Darwin in here. Uh, the Darwin term, just like the relativistic kinetic energy term, is a purely orbital operator. And so all of this analysis of switching back to the uncoupled basis goes through in exactly the same way. And so I'll just erase it in the same way as it did for the relativistic kinetic energy. So I'll just erase it and summarize the result, which is that this becomes equal to in L0 sandwiched around the Darwin term, like this. And it uh, becomes a purely, again, a purely orbital matrix element. Um, now, uh, this in turn, if you examine the Darwin term, it's a bunch of constants times a delta function. If I copy the constants, it's pi over 2, c v e squared h bar squared divided by uh, m squared c squared. Then the remaining matrix element is going to look like this. It will be an integral over all space, d cubed r. And then we've got the wave function, psi n l0 of r, absolute value squared. And then it's multiplied times the delta function of r. Okay? Now, uh, I'll remind you that the uh, wave functions in central force motion go like r to the l near the origin. Delta function is going to make us evaluate this at the origin. So what that means is that all the wave functions vanish at the origin except when L is equal to zero. And the result is, is that this Darwin term only has an effect on, on the L, on the L uh, equals zero or the S waves. So uh, this, this, if I take this, if I take the integral, let me take the whole integral here, we can erase this. If we take the whole integral, then uh, this is this is equal to delta L zero at zero unless L is equal to zero. And then the result is when that is then multiplied by the value of the wave function at, 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 at squared at, at R equals at the origin at R equals zero. So this becomes then multiplied by psi n zero zero of zero absolute value squared. And 
This square root of the wave function, in turn, is the radial wave function, Rn0, evaluated at 0 squared, times y0, 0, 0, absolute value squared. And the y0, 0, 0, absolute value squared is just 1 over 4 pi, because y0, 0, 0 is a constant. As far as the square root of the wave function, the, or the radial wave function of the origin is concerned, that was also something that appeared in the homework problem. This is in the volume effect, which I guess is this week's homework, isn't it? Lost track. Anyway, it's up there at the top of the board. And one can plug that into, into here, and then, and then pull all the pieces together. And so once again, there's some algebra to do. And uh, I uh, will just summarize the results and give you the uh, energy shift uh, for the Darwin term. And it is equal to this. It becomes, uh, I'll write it in the same form as the alpha squared times the unperturbed energy level with a minus sign minus n. And then what's left is 1 over n times delta L0. Okay. And that leaves only the spin orbit term, the last one, which uh, goes as you can see uh, constants times 1 over r cubed times L dot s. So it depends on spin. As far as 1 over r cubed goes, that's of course a scalar operator and under both or orbital, purely orbital rotations as well as total rotations generated by j. Uh, but L dot S is different because it involves the spin. So uh, we're going to be interested in the energy shifts which, are, which, involve, uh, which involve sandwiching the spin orbit term between uh, vectors, diagonal vectors of the, uh, of the coupled basis. So it's going to be this, NLJ, M sub J. It's going to be the constant z squared over twice m squared z squared multiplied times the matrix element, which is 1 over r cubed times L dot s, and then nlj m sub j on the other side. And uh, this is the this is the energy shift delta e to the spin orbit is equal to this. Uh, the L dot S is the place to begin, uh, begin analyzing this. Uh, we use a simple identity that says that the square of the total angular momentum, which is, which is the orbital plus spin vector squared, is the same thing as L squared plus twice L dot S plus an S squared, just expanding it out. So we can solve for L dot S, and this is then one half of J squared minus L squared minus S squared. Now, j squared, l squared, and s squared are members, are operators, which are members of the complete set, which is used to specify these basis vectors. The, l, the, the lowercase l is the l squared, the lowercase j is j squared, and, and, uh, and jz is the operator corresponding to m sub j. And s squared is suppressed, but it's in there too. It's a constant operator. And so we sandwich between these, these, uh, these uh, uh, basis vectors this operator just takes on its eigenvalue, which is one half of the quantity j times j plus one minus l times l plus one minus s times s plus one. And s times s plus one is actually three quarters because it's a half times three halves. The spin is constant. And so the L dot S then with this substitution just gets replaced by this constant value, and then you're left with the expectation value of 1 over R cubed, uh, which can be handled in exactly the same way as the, as the earlier two operators, which were purely orbital operators. And we end up needing to use this expectation value 1 over R cubed here. Now there's a slight problem which arises, uh, namely that the average value of 1 over R cubed has a 1 over L in the denominator, so it would appear that it's infinity for an S wave. It actually is. It is infinity for an S wave. The infinity clearly comes from the fact that the R cubed diverges at the origin, and so the integral doesn't uh, give you an infinite value in that case. So what does this mean about the spin orbit term? Well, uh, if you're dealing with an S wave, which is what, where L is equal to 0, then the, uh, the L operator, the, orbital, the L vector operator, that's restricted to that subspace, becomes a 0 operator. So in a sense, we have a singular form here that looks like 0 over 0 in the, in the case of S waves. So there's a question about how to interpret it. Uh, here's a way of handling that. Is take the Coulomb potential, uh, which is hiding, hiding in, in the wave functions here. You take the Coulomb potential, which is hiding in the wave functions, and you uh, smooth it out uh, near the singularity of, 
a physically realistic way of doing this is just what you're doing in the volume effect where you spread the charge over a sphere of small radius. If you do that, then you find that this divergence uh, for the S waves of 1 over R cubed goes away. You get a finite answer. However, it's still true that the L operator is 0 in the subspace of, of where lowercase l is equal to 0. So now you've got 0 divided by something which is finite, and the answer is therefore 0. So the correct limit that you get if you shrink the uh, size of the charge uh, distribution is that the answer is 0 in the case of L equals 0. In other words, we only use this expression given up here for the average value 1 over r cubed in the case where L is not equal to 0. When you put that together, then here's what you get for the uh, energy shift due to the fine structure terms. It's the same C alpha squared times minus E n. And then it goes as uh, 1 over 2 n. And then it is the J times J plus 1 minus L times L plus 1 minus 3 quarters that came from our L dot S. And then it's divided by the L times L plus a half times L plus 1 that came from the expectation value of 1 over R cubed. And this is only for the case L equals 0. In fact, if I do this right, I need to put brackets here and say that the answer is 0 and L is equal to 0. All right. And so this is the, these are the results then of the, uh, of the first order perturbation theory, uh, degenerate perturbation theory using the uh, three fine structure terms. And so what we want to do is to add these up now and to get the total energy shift due to the fine structure. So obviously there's some algebra involved in doing that. And I'll just quote the results and skip the algebra. And what we get is delta T fine structure and uh, here's what it turns into. I'll write it in the same form as Z alpha quantity squared times minus D sub N. And then there's a factor of 1 over N squared. And then you have 3 quarters minus N divided by J plus a half. And this has to be regarded as an important result, a fundamental result in the theory of the hydrogen atom, hydrogen-like atoms, it should be shift in the energy levels uh, due to, uh, due to uh, spin and relativistic effects. All right. Um, so uh, to begin a discussion of this result, and probably the most striking feature about it is that the uh, energy shift does not depend on the L quantum number. You'll recall that the energy levels of the, uh, of the, of the electrostatic model of hydrogen are, are degenerate in the, in the L quantum numbers. The energies don't depend on L, they depend only on the principal quantum <coughs> number. And that, in, that fact that the energies are independent of L persists, uh, to at least the first order perturbation theory, when we include the fine structure terms. This is kind of a miracle because the three terms individually do depend on L, as you see there and here, and there's L dependence here and there too. But when you add it all up, it all, it all cancels out, and we get this result. Now, the energies do depend on the uh, quantum number J, which is the new quantum number that's been introduced, in addition to N. So I'm going from the electrostatic model to what we might call the fine structure model. The energies, which originally depended on N, now have the form of E sub N J. They depend on both N and J, but not L. Of course, they don't depend on the MJ either, because that's, a, that's because it's a scalar operator but the fact that it's independent of L is, is, a, is a something else. And it shows that some of, the, some of the extra symmetry that exists in the Coulomb model of hydrogen actually persists into the relativistic version of the hydrogen atom. All right. Now, uh, the next thing to say is I've already, just, I've already went through the order of magnitude of this. It's something like 10 to the minus 4 relative to unperturbed levels in the case of ordinary hydrogen. Uh, if you look at this in a little more detail, you can show that this is always negative. But you can show it's, so it suppresses all of the energy levels of the Coulomb model. But it suppresses the uh, smaller values of the smaller J more than it does the values of the higher J, so that the energy levels are an increasing function of J when the fine structure terms are included. And so now let me show you uh, what that does uh, qualitatively, at least to the, uh, to the uh, energy levels of the, uh, of the hydrogen atom. So uh, I think I can get rid of all of this now. So um, the 
ground state and hydrogen atom in the microstatic model is, of course, the 1s level. Uh, S, S, of course, means that L equals 0. And if we can combine 0 with a half, a half of the spin, the only possible value of J is a half. So this is L, S, and this is the J values. And so the ground state of hydrogen is necessarily J equals 1 half level. Uh, it's customary to use to explicitly indicate the J value in the subscript underneath the, the letter for the ag orbital angular momentum. So this is called the 1s1 half level if we want to uh, indicate fine structure of S. Similarly, the 2s level in the unperturbed system becomes the 2s1 half level because again, J equals 1 half is the only J value allowed. On the other hand, for the 2p level, a p state means that L is equal to 1. We're now combining orbital and spin with one cross a half, which gives us two possible values of J, which is one half and three halves. And so the two P states of the unperturbed system split according to the J values, and you get a two P one half and a two P three halves. The two P one half in this model is exactly the generator of the two, F, two, two S one half because the L values are the same and the J values are the same. Uh, however, the 2p3 halves has a different j value, and, and, and it is raised by a certain amount like this, and so you get uh, you get a you see a splitting of the uh, of the levels of the unperturbed system. Likewise, if we go on with the n equals three, we have the, the 3s a half, which is degenerate with the 3p a half. Somewhere above that is the 3p3 halves. That's degenerate with the 3d3 halves, and then somewhere above that is the 3d5 halves. So including fine structure effects, the n equals 3 level of the unperturbed system is now split into three different levels. These two are degenerate, these two are degenerate, there's that one floating at the top. The n equals 2 has two levels and so on like this. So this is uh, qualitatively the effects of the fine structure. This of course is not the scale because this splitting, at least in hydrogen, is 10,000 times smaller than the separation between these two. All right. Now, um, so that's the qualitative effects. Now, um, there is a question that arises. We did this by perturbation theory, and we got uh, the uh, energy shifts uh, in first order perturbation theory. We found that they were independent of the L quantum number. There's a question about whether that would persist to higher orders of perturbation theory. Is it exact or is it only result of first order perturbation theory? The easiest way to analyze this uh, question is not to go to higher order of perturbation theory, but rather to use the Dirac equation, uh, which is a something like a relativistic uh, version of a Pauli equation for, for an electron. It includes a spin, uh, but it's a fully relativistic equation. And it turns out that it's possible to solve the Dirac equation exactly in the, uh, in the Coulomb field. And if you do, uh, what you find is you get energy levels E and J, uh, which are depend only on N and J. They don't depend on L. And there's a somewhat complicated formula for it. I'll write down like this. It's mc squared divided by a great big square root. It's one plus a big bracket. There's z alpha numerator here. There's n minus j minus a half. And then there's plus the square root of j plus a half squared minus the quantity z alpha squared. This whole thing, this whole thing in the square brackets get squared. It's a fairly complicated formula like this. Um, now, Z alpha is the quantity which is small in hydrogen, not so small in uranium. Uh, let's expand uh, this result in, in powers of Z alpha. And if you do, what you get is MC squared, the rest mass of the electron is the leading term. Uh, the first term is 1. Then you get minus quantity Z alpha squared divided by twice N squared. The next term is Z alpha to the fourth divided by twice N to the fourth. And this is multiplied uh, times this uh, 3 quarters minus n divided by j plus a half. And then you get extra terms out there at the end, like this. This is square bracket, so they balance. This is the expansion of the, uh, of the uh, energy eigenvalues of the Dirac equation in powers of z, z alpha. And what you see is there's a leading term, which is the rest mass of the electron, which is normally included in relativistic theories. The next term is the energy levels of the, of the uh, electrostatic model. These are the Bohr energy levels. Uh, they're a factor of z alpha squared down from the rest mass. Uh, the, next, uh, the next correction is another factor of z alpha squared down from that. These are the fine structure levels which were just evaluated by perturbation theory. The same result comes from expanding the, 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 uh, the eigenvalues of the Dirac equation. 
But if you wanted to, you could go on to next order to z alpha to the six and get the next corrections down. Now, actually, there's no uh, no good reason to do that to go on to order z alpha to the six because there's other effects, uh, physical effects, which are smaller than the fine structure effects, but they're larger than the next z alpha to the six term, uh, which are not incorporated in the, into the Dirac equation and, and become important physically. There's actually two effects that appear at that order. Uh, one of these is the uh, hyperfine effects, uh, which uh, I will lecture on, but not this semester. And the other one is the Lamb shift. Uh, the hyperfine effects involve the magnetic interaction of the uh, electron with the proton nucleus. There's two spins, they have magnetic dipole moments, and there's a dipole-dipole magnetic interaction. Uh, I won't say more about that uh, now, uh, but that. The lamp shift, however, I want to say something about that uh, because it, uh, it's, uh, it's relevant to this picture here. <coughs> the uh, lamp shift involves uh, the interaction of the atomic electron with the quantized electromagnetic field as well as the quantized uh, electron-positron field. It involves diagrams like this. Is that there's an atomic electron. Uh, it emits a photon. So here's the Feynman diagram like this. It emits and then reabsorbs a photon. And diagrams like this give rise to an energy shift, which is the which is the Lamb shift. Um, the main effect, the most important effect of the Lamb shift is that it suppresses the 2p one half level relative to the 2 one s one half level. In other words, it breaks the L degeneracy, which is present all the way through the Dirac model. And so if I include the Lamb shift, the more realistic picture here is that if I draw a dotted line for the 2 s one half, then the 2p one half level is slightly below that. And the numbers are something like this, is that the, uh, the lamp shift itself is something like about 1.0 gigahertz, if I put it in frequency terms, whereas the splitting between the 2p half and 2p3 halves is about 10 gigahertz, about 10 times as large. And so this is, a, this is actually a realistic uh, uh, a picture of the uh, n equals 2 levels of hydrogen, including all the physics. And you see you've got a splitting of the 2s half and 2p halves. There's really three levels here. Okay, well, um, I'm going to stop at this point because I have to hand out these, uh, these evaluations, and uh, I would like to ask you to volunteer to collect them and then uh, take them to the office. Uh, next time, I'll